All right, and welcome back to the second lecture in our uh, discussion on chapter 19, which has to do with free energy and thermodynamics. And picking up where we left off, we're going to be discussing a little bit about absolute entropy and uh, the third law of thermodynamics. And then we'll transition into more discussion about uh, free energy and variations on that theme. So right off the gate, definition, absolute entropy. Absolute entropy is a substance of a substance is the amount of energy it has due to the dispersion of energy through its particles. And we've been discussing microstates, macrostates, and the more ways you can disperse energy through those two things, the higher the entropy. What the third law states is that, uh, is variation on this or clarification, is that entropy for any perfect crystalline substance is zero at zero degrees Kelvin. And this is a really important definition because when we're talking about ways energy can disperse through all these different microstates and macrostates, at zero degrees Kelvin, we have no thermal energy. There's no energy associated with excitation of particles. And because of that, and the lack of excitation, there isn't a mechanism for dispersion of energy, regardless of number of possible states. Therefore, the entropy has to be zero. So remember, for any crystalline substance at zero Kelvin, entropy is zero. Um, now, a substance that isn't a perfect crystal at absolute zero has some energy from entropy uh, because it has the ability to be in translational motion uh, despite not having any thermal energy allowing for excitation. However, its entropy is going to be incredibly low at zero. So, moving along, a little bit more information about standard molar entropy because uh, if you think back to some of the things we talked about in 105 there are standard molar equivalents for so many different things that have been measured and we can pull these off of tables do tabulations and some of the things we're going to be discussing through the rest of this lecture um, have to do with uh, tabular information under specific circumstances which we can abstract and use to our advantage for predictive qualities so standard molar entropy is denoted with this little not sign. So you have the entropy with capital S and then the standard molar contribution is that little not. And this is an extensive property. So standard molar entropy values are for one mole of substance at standard temperature 298 Kelvin for a particular state, which has to be defined, a particular allotrope, a particular molecular complexity, a particular molar mass, and a particular degree of solution. Um, so these are all things that have to be defined as standard uh, when we're measuring entropy. And these are a variety of the uh, standard molar entropy values, joules per mole Kelvin, for different gases, liquids, and solids. And these are just examples. Obviously, there's no expectation of you remembering any of these specific quantities. The point being, you should be able to abstract trends from these tables for predictive um, questions, as well as be able to pull specifics from these tables to uh, solve different problems that you may face. So uh, what we're going to follow up with is some of those trends that I've just mentioned. So some of these trends include that for standard molar entropies, state makes a huge difference in the degree of standard molar entropy. So an example, gas states have much higher levels of entropy than liquid states. We've discussed this a little bit, but this is an actual value attached to that trend. And liquid states have larger entropies than solid states. And th this example below is just looking at the difference between liquid water and gaseous water. Uh, liquid water has a standard molar entropy of 70.0 joules per mole Kelvin, whereas gaseous water, of course, is under standard state, 298 Kelvin, is 188.8 joules per mole Kelvin, which is more than twice the amount of entropy associated with liquid form. Likewise, molar mass plays a role in the level of entropy. So in terms of general trends, the larger the molar mass, 
the larger the entropy, because heavier atoms are closer to each other, allowing for the dispersal of energy through these states um, when everything else is held equal, of course. So if we're comparing you know, helium to neon to argon uh, to krypton to xenon, you see a trend where the joules per mole Kelvin of relative standard entropy increases as the molar mass of these elements increase. Likewise, molecular complexity plays an important role when we're evaluating relative standard entropy in terms of trends. So just like larger, more complex molecules generally have larger entropies, um, molecules which allow for more energy states to be available through the complexity of their structure also have higher standard entropies. So if we were to compare, say, argon to uh, nitrogen monoxide, which we're seeing in this first chart, you'll notice right out the gate that the argon has a molar mass which is higher than the nitrogen monoxide. However, the standard molar entropy for the nitrogen monoxide is higher than the argon. And the reason for that is because of having two nuclei which are uh, covalently bound to one another, which allows for the dispersion of energy in more diverse ways than having a single nuclei. An uh, even better example is in this second chart where we're looking at carbon monoxide versus ethane. So we have carbon and an oxygen, so just two nuclei, versus two carbons and four hydrogens. And even though the molecular mass of these two are incredibly similar, 28.0 something for both of them, we see that we have a higher level of relative of uh, the standard entropy for the ethane than we do for the carbon monoxide at 219.3 versus 197.7 joules per mole Kelvin. And this is also an example of having more means for an energy to disperse uh, through different bonds and through different orientations of this uh, molecule. When I'm talking about places for energy to disperse, this is a reminder of some of the different ways energies can disperse. We have translational motion, where something physically moves. We have rotational motion. If you have free rotation around a bond, particularly an S-bond with no pi bonds, you can have freedom of rotation around that bond where the nuclei can rotate around the bond. And we have vibrational motions, where bonds compress and bonds stretch. All these things allow for different mechanisms of dispersion of energy. So whenever you have a bond between multiple nuclei or increasing number of nuclei increasing number of atoms associated with a molecule, this inherently increases the complexity and the number of mechanisms by which energy can disperse. So if we were thinking back to our discussion in the previous lecture about dispersion of energy through different microstates, this would be uh, relate back to those uh, examples. Likewise, there's differences in levels of standard entropy, entropy for a compound, whether it's in a solid phase or dissolved in aqueous solution. So dissolved solids typically have higher levels of entropy than their solid state because of the, uh, the distribution of the particles throughout the mixture and the increased ability for them to change in terms of translational orientation. And this is a really good example uh, where we have uh, one solid which has in a solid phase 143.1 joules per mole Kelvin, but if you dissolve it in water, it has a standard entropy of 265.7 joules per mole Kelvin. Now, we can go to those tables to look for changes of entropy of a reaction by looking at the sum of the standard entropies of the reactants and the sum of the standard entropies of the products and looking at the difference between those two. Given, of course, we're looking under standard conditions for these kinds of questions. So it has to be 298 Kelvin. It uh, has to be other standard conditions associated with that. But as long as we're willing to assume or specify standard conditions, we can use these tables that we were just looking at a couple slides ago to look at the standard change in entropy 
for any particular reaction under standard conditions. So uh, referring to this reaction, if we want to evaluate the standard entropy change, what we're going to be looking at is the difference between the sum of the entropy of the products minus the sum of the entropy of the reactants. A few things to remember. Although uh, we made assumptions about standard enthalpy, delta H of formation, um, and remember potentially that the enthalpy formation of an element is zero kilojoules per mole. When we're dealing with entropy, we can't make that assumption 25 degrees Celsius because entropy will always be positive for this condition. So we need to go to that table. We can't make that assumption of zero like we were for enthalpy. Uh, now, this gives us two different mechanisms by which we can calculate delta G or standard delta G now because if we're interested in calculating delta G under standard conditions at 25 degrees Celsius, we can go straight to the table and we can calculate delta G for the reaction under standard conditions for the same mechanism, looking at the sum of the free energy of the products minus the sum of the free energy of the reactants. However, if we're looking at temperatures other than 25 degrees Celsius, assuming the change of the enthalpy and the entropy is relatively low, which is reasonable for small variations from 25 degrees Celsius, we should probably use the relationship uh, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So delta G formation under standard conditions is called the free energy of formation. And this free energy formation is the change of free energy when one mole, this is all, remember, standard conditions, one mole of a compound forms from its constituent elements in their standard states. So these are the specificities. It has to be standard states. We're talking about one mole as our standard. So this is going to be defined as kilojoules per mole. And the free energy formation of pure elements in their standard states is zero. We reiterate, free energy, a formation of a pure element in their standard state of zero. So for something like um, hydrogen gas, it's going to be zero. Oxygen gas is zero. Nitrogen gas, zero. All elemental compounds, graphite in its lowest energy, pure carbon form, zero. But when we start to have non-pure elements, when we're looking at molecules like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water, ammonia, etc. These are all going to have uh, known tabulated free energies of formation associated with them. So let's work a couple of problems. We've spent the next last 10 slides or so just adding conceptual ideas, but we don't get grades in chemistry for being able to discuss conceptual ideas, we get grades in chemistry for being able to make accurate numerical predictions associated with questions. So let's do a couple questions and work through applying these ideas. Let's see what problem we have here. So this question asks for us to solve or calculate the standard change of entropy of reaction for the balanced chemical equation where we have four molecules of ammonia reacting with five molecules of oxygen gas. And this leads to the formation of four equivalents of nitrogen monoxide plus six equivalents of water in the gas phase. So all these are in gas phase. So how do we approach this? Well, the first thing we do is we go right to our tables associated with standard uh, levels of entropy per mole. And we and this is given for the book as appendix 2B. And remember to check your state because state makes such a big difference. And a lot of these have values in solid, liquid, and gas phases. So make sure you're picking gas phase for this particular problem. And this particular problem, you'd find that for ammonia gas, there's 198 point, uh, excuse me, 192.8 joules per mole Kelvin. For oxygen gas, there'd be 
210.2 joules per mole Kelvin entropy. For nitrogen monoxide, 210.8 joules per mole Kelvin, and water would have 188.8 joules per mole Kelvin of entropy. So what we would need to do is segregate these into the appropriate uh, reactant and product groups, and then account for the number of moles in the stoichiometric ratios. So in products, we would have NO, and for water, we'd have H2O. So we have our two products here, and we'd have our reactants with the ammonia and the oxygen. And for the nitrogen monoxide, we'd have four molar equivalents. For water, six molar equivalents. For ammonia, four molar equivalents. For oxygen, five molar equivalents. And this is what you see here in the second step. So we would get four times the entropy of nitrogen monoxide plus six times the molar entropy for water minus four times the molar entropy for ammonia plus five times the molar entropy, standard molar entropy for oxygen gas. And when we sub all these things in, accounting carefully for our positive and negatives, we would see that we would have a standard entropy of reaction for 100, of this particular reaction of 178.8 joules per Kelvin. So what I'd suggest everybody do at this point is use this opportunity to take this practice problem, looking at the reaction between uh, hydrogen sulfide gas and oxygen forming water plus sulfur dioxide, and apply the exact same rationale we just did to make sure it all makes sense, to make sure everything's flowing smoothly, and then move on to the next slide. Let's give you a second here. And pause, work through it. and moving on to the next tile of problem. So let's do another problem calculating the standard change in free energy for reaction using the delta G equals delta H minus T delta S for standard conditions of a reaction. And for this particular reaction, we're going to be evaluating SO2 gas plus 1 half molar equivalent of oxygen gas reacting to form SO3. And of course, this could be uh, two equivalents of SO2 plus one equivalent of O2 uh, goes to two equivalents of SO3. However, uh, this is what it's given, and we can make either of them work. So what we're tasked with is calculating the uh, standard free energy change of reaction at 25 degrees Celsius and determine whether or not this reaction is spontaneous under the condition. So what we would do, these are all gas phase. We would look up these components uh, in the table 2B, appendix 2B, for gas phase specifically. And because we're looking for delta G, we need to look up delta H and delta S. We are given T at 25C, so that's going to be 298 Kelvin. Now, remember, this is going to be products minus reactants. So our product is SO3, and our reactants are SO and O2. And then you just have to make sure you adjust for the appropriate stoichiometric coefficients, which will be one, one half, and one going from left to right across the reaction. So here we're looking at our products, <coughs> which is just SO3, and it has molar equivalent of one. So we can plug it right in. And then we're going to subtract the sum of our SO2 plus one half of O2. And if we're paying attention to our negatives and our positives, we're going to end up with a negative 98.8 kilojoules for our uh, delta H. Now, we have to do the exact same thing for our delta S. Now give us a negative 94.0. And now that we have delta H and delta S, we can substitute this in to delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Remembering that we always use absolute uh, Kelvin for temperature. So 298 Kelvin instead of 25 C. 
and we're going to just plug and chug and get our delta G, and this is going to be negative 70.9 kilojoules. Because it's negative, we know immediately that this is a spontaneous reaction. And here's another opportunity for you to practice this. <coughs> Excuse me. And I encourage you to do so because there's um, easy to burn out just watching slide after slide. Take this opportunity, make sure that it makes sense, plug everything in, see if you can get through it, see if it makes sense, and then let's move on to the next one. So let's do another example here where we're using the same relationship of g equals h minus t delta s. And this question in particular is asking for us to estimate the value of uh, delta G for reaction under standard conditions, uh, delta G at 125 degrees Celsius. If the reaction more or less spontaneous at this elevated temperature. That is, is the value of delta G for the reaction more negative ooh, or more positive? Excellent. Okay, so let's estimate delta G for the reaction at the new temperature, and we'll use the relationship above to do so. So because we're non-standard temperature, we're going to just make an estimation, and then we're going to see if it's more or less spontaneous at that new temperature versus the original. So delta G for the reaction would be uh, minus 98 times 10 to the 3 joules for our standard enthalpy. And then we'll use 398 Kelvin as our temperature because it's 125 Celsius. And we'll use negative 94.0 joules per Kelvin as our standard entropy. And minding our arithmetic, this will give us a delta G of reaction of minus 61.5 kilojoules at 125 degrees Celsius. So since the value of delta G for the reaction at this particular temperature is less negative, which is more positive than the value of delta G for the reaction 25, which is minus 70.9 kilojoules. This reaction is less spontaneous. And in a few slides, we're going to discuss what does less spontaneous versus more spontaneous mean. So if something's at equilibrium and then you push it just infinitesimally past equilibrium to spontaneity, you probably have a sense that the reaction will favor products. That's true, but only infinitesimally so. However, if we make it more spontaneous, and I wish you could see me throwing up quotation marks, it's going to become more favorable to our products. You do it even more, and it'll become even more favorable. And this immediately should be setting off the alarms in your head, oh, delta G is related to K because K is an expression of our ratio of our products to our reactants. And that's exactly what we're going to be seeing in a few slides when we start relating these two quantities. But when I say something's more spontaneous or less spontaneous, I'm actually not just talking about whether or not reaction proceeds, but specifically proceeds past the point of equilibrium. and whether or not products are favored over reactants. So, let's see here. Before doing so, let's just review some of these important relationships that we've been discussing with delta G. First point, if a reaction can be expressed as a series of reactions, the sum, so if you can link reactions together, which we've done in Chem 105, if a reaction can be expressed as a series of reactions, where the products of one reaction become the reactants for a subsequent reaction, and you can do this for two or three or four reactions, the sum of the delta value, G values of the individual reaction is the same as the delta G for the total reaction. So you can identify the delta G for each step and then just simply sum them because delta G is a state function. How you get from point A to point B doesn't matter. It's the fact that there's a difference that's discrete between point A and point B. So if you make multiple steps along the way with sub-steps of reactions, 
that doesn't matter. If you know all the component delta g's, you can simply sum them and you'll get the delta g for the total reaction. Likewise, if you know the delta g for reaction going forward, reading left to right, if you're interested in the reverse, reverse reaction, it being read from right to left, or you're thinking about a process in terms of its reversible applications, you just simply reverse the sign of delta g. So if reading it from right, right to left, it's negative x. If you read it left to right, it's positive x, or vice versa. Finally, if you multiply the amount of materials by a specific factor, let's say we've got our nice equations, everything's reduced to its uh, lowest integral value, like we typically do. But we multiply that by five times, we can simply multiply the delta G associated with that lowest integral factor by the same number. Um, so if everything gets multiplied in terms of the number of moles being consumed or evaluated in a reaction, that multiplication factor just applies to our delta G exactly the same way. So let's look at a few examples of this really quickly. And I think everyone will, um, I, don't, I don't anticipate anyone struggling with this particular thing, but it's nice to just look through a few examples to make sure the concept's ingrained. So let's look at this general reaction. We've got three carbons in solid state reacting with four equivalents of hydrogen gas leading to the formation of propane gas. And we want to find the delta G of reaction for this under standard conditions. Well, we can break this up into three sub-reactions. We can look that we have propane plus five oxygen leads to the formation of three carbon dioxide and four water. We have a reaction where carbon plus oxygen leads to carbon dioxide. And we have a reaction where two equivalents of hydrogen gas plus one equivalent of oxygen gas leads to the equivalent of two equivalents of water gas. So importantly, note that we have some commonalities between these. We have CO2 here and we have CO2 here. We have Let's see here, water here, and water here. We have a couple ways we can link these. So to work the problem, we just need to manipulate some of these given reactions, which have known values, in a way that gets us the information we need. And since this first reaction um, has propane as a reactant, the reaction of interest has protein as a product, we're just going to reverse it. So notice we've got our propane here and we've got propane here. Let me erase that really quick so we don't make this too messy. So what we're going to do is we're just going to write the first reaction backwards. So we're going to take reaction one, just write it backwards and reverse the sign of delta G. So instead of Delta G being minus 2,074 2, kilojoules, it's going to become positive 2,074 kilojoules as newly written. Notice that the second reaction has a carbon as a reactant and CO2 as a product. However, the coefficient for carbon is 1, and in the reaction of interest, the coefficient of carbon is 3. So we're looking at reaction 2 here. Well, carbon and oxygen leads to CO2, well, we've got three CO2 here. So we're going to have to multiply that by three to get everything balanced. And that's what we've done here. So instead of just being minus 394.4 kilojoules, it's going to be that times three, which is equivalent to negative 1,183 kilojoules. Finally, looking at reaction three, coefficient for hydrogen gas is going to be 2. So we're going to have to multiply our standard coefficient for the hydrogen gas that we saw from the previous slide, where we only had a, we have two hydrogen gas here, and we're going to have leading to two waters, and here we've got the exact same thing, so we've got to multiply that by 2, 
And then when we stack everything together as transformed, you can see how everything cancels because we can cancel our products and our reactants that are redundant when we're balancing the equation. So our three carbon dioxides cancel, our three oxygens are removed from this one. We have two oxygens to remove as well, so these three and these two equal five. There go those five, four waters, four waters, and we're left with three carbons, four hydrogen gas, and one molecule of propane. Our new balanced equation we're interested in and our delta G for this reaction is negative 23 kilojoules. So for fun, try applying some of these logical steps to solve the following problem. And once you're done with this, go ahead and jump on in to the next slide. So I'll pause here for a minute. And moving on. So what are we talking about when we talk about free energy? Why is free energy free? So free energy is the maximum amount of energy available to do work on a system. And uh, in terms of chemistry, most often this is considered um, chemical energy. However, sometimes we have very violent chemical reactions that can exert uh, work on other systems to heat things or to physically uh, pressurize systems, move things. And this is most common with combustion or, or rapid uh, aggressive chemical reactions. So for a lot of exothermic reactions, some of the heat is released due to the enthalpy change. And this goes into increasing the entropy of the surroundings, so it's not available to do work. Um, whenever we're increasing energy surroundings, th that is no longer available to do work. So that's energy lost to the environment. Uh, so how much energy is free? And that's when we're discussing free energy versus total energy change within a system. That's the dis uh, difference we're discussing there. Now, we spent a whole bunch of time talking about standard conditions, but what happens if we need to specifically predict free energy for non-standard conditions? Well, the minute we're not at one atmosphere, one mole concentration and normal temperature, we don't have tabular information for that. And if we're not doing OK with approximations, we need to have an adjustment. So under non-standard conditions, we can identify delta G by finding delta G under standard conditions. And then we have a correction factor with RTL and Q, where Q is the reaction quotient. Now remember, delta G equals zero at equilibrium, but Q is the reaction quotient in the moment. So let's do a quick walkthrough of what this might look like. So let's consider the reaction at 298 Kelvin, where we have two equivalents of nitrogen monoxide plus oxygen gas, forming two equivalents of nitrogen dioxide gas. And delta G, under standard conditions for this reaction, because we have that little not symbol, is negative 71.2 kilojoules. So what we want to do is calculate the delta G for this reaction under non-standard conditions if we have partial pressures of nitrogen monoxide of 0.1 atmosphere, of oxygen for 0.1 atmospheres, and nitrogen dioxide for 2.0 atmospheres. And then we want to find out, is this reaction more or less spontaneous under this condition than under standard conditions? So the first step, we've got to figure out Q. So we're going to use the law of mass action to calculate Q. It's just like calculating K, where we're going to look at our ratio of our products over our ratio of our reactants, of course, adjusting for our uh, molar equivalents. And in this case, our reactant is only nitrogen dioxide, in this case squared, because there's two molar equivalents. Our partial pressure of nitrogen monoxide, also squared, because there's two molar equivalents, and our partial pressure of oxygen are two factors that we put on our uh, 
denominator because that is our, our, our reactants. And then we can substitute our partial pressures in for these, in this case, 2.00 atmospheres for nitrogen dioxide, 0 0.100 and 0 0.100 for our nitrogen monoxide and oxygen respectively. And that will give us a reaction quotient of 4,000 or four times 10 to the third. So now we've got Q. So now we just need to substitute Q, T, and delta G under standard conditions into the equation to, cal um, to calculate delta G for the reaction under these non-standard conditions. So whew, let's jump on in here. Um, delta G for the reaction is going to be under standard conditions, negative 71.2, because it's given right here. So we're going to plug that right in. R is our classic 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. We're going to sub in at 298 Kelvin. So Kelvins are going to cancel right away. We see right here. And Q is going to be, well, natural log of Q is natural log of 4,000. So everything is going to go right to joules. And we're going to end up with a negative 50.7 kilojoules under these particular circumstances. So in this case, under these reaction conditions, we have a less negative uh, delta G under these conditions than we do under standard conditions. Therefore, this would be less spontaneous. Or another way to view it, the products would be less favored than they were under standard conditions. So here's another good example um, that you guys can take a stab at. I really recommend utilizing these examples to really hammer it in, to just let your mind recite what you just saw. And um, I think you'll get a lot more out of these online lectures, taking the opportunity to just run through this one time before moving on. So please do so. And then we'll move on to the next slide. And we are almost there. I think we only have another three or four slides left on this lecture. You'll have to excuse me because this slide made it in on accident. So disregard, moving on. Mm, this is where I wanted to go. So only a few more slides left. I talked about a few minutes ago when we were discussing something being less spontaneous versus more spontaneous and what that meant and told you that we're going to relate delta G to K. And that is what we're about to do. So because delta G equals zero at equilibrium, and we saw that delta G equals let me run back so you guys can see. Uh, under non-standard conditions equals delta G naught plus RT ln Q, and at equilibrium Q equals K, delta G under non-standard conditions equals RT ln K. So what we've officially done here is we've seen now a relationship between free energy change for reaction, equilibrium for that reaction, R is a constant, and the only variable that relates them is the absolute temperature. How fantastic is that? I love it when we have such elegance in our um, physical sciences. So remember that when we're discussing equilibrium, we're also simultaneously be able to make, I don't want to say assumptions, abstract information regarding the free energy change, which fundamentally makes a reaction take place. And likewise, if we're looking at the thermodynamics of a reaction, we have gained simultaneous insight into the equilibrium of that reaction. So if k is less than 1, 
delta G is positive, inherently. And the reaction is spontaneous in the reverse direction under standard conditions. Nothing's going to happen. If K is greater than 1, delta G is negative, and the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction under standard conditions. And if K equals 1, delta G is 0, and everything's at equilibrium. So remember, delta G is minus, negative, it's spontaneous. And products are favored because products are over reactants. So it's greater than 1. If K is less than 1, that's because the reactants are favored over the products. The reaction does not proceed favoring products. It proceeds a little bit, just doesn't favor products. And under those conditions, delta G is going to be inherently positive, vice versa. In equilibrium, G is 0, K is 1. Once again, I think this is a slide that I probably should have omitted. What we're really looking at here is whether or not at a specific point of a reaction, progress of a reaction curve, based on Q versus the K, predicting whether it moves towards equilibrium. But I don't think this is something that uh, we need to worry about because it's a little beyond the scope of what I'm going to be quizzing you. But it, feel free to uh, engage with it a little bit. So. Big questions. Why is the equilibrium constant temperature dependent? That's the one variable that's driving this, right? So if we take these look at these two equations, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, and delta G equals negative R T L N K, we can set them equivalent to each other because both of them have delta G as a single term. So we can just make them equivalent to one another, and then we can rearrange to solve these in the form of a Y equals MX plus B equation, where that's our y, that's our m, that's our x, and that's our b. So you can literally plot k versus inverse t, and from a linear plot of equilibrium at different temperatures, pull out delta h and delta s, and therefore be able to calculate delta g at any temperature for a reaction. Very cool model. Let me raise this for you guys. So let's take a look at one last example problem. I think this is it. And then we'll move. This will be the end of chapter 19. So. Let's use tabulated free energies of formation to calculate the equilibrium constant for the reaction, this reaction at 298 Kelvin. So N2O4 in gaseous phase is in equilibrium with two equivalents of NO2, also in gas state. If we look up in appendix 2B, a standard free energy formation for each of these, we see N2O4 gas has 99.8 kilojoules per mole, and NO2 gas is 51.3 kilojoules per mole. So what we're going to do is just look at our products minus our reactants, remembering that we have to adjust for the number of moles in our coefficients. And so for our products, it's going to be 2 times uh, the term for NO2, which is 51.3, minus 1 times 99.8. And wow, pretty close to equilibrium, but not quite, 2.8 kilojoules is our delta G under standard conditions for the reaction. So now we're going to calculate K from this by solving equation 19.14 for K and substituting the values of delta G for the reaction and temperature. So what we can do is just get our equation, rearrange to solve for K by pulling the natural log of K out substituting what we've got and solving. And then you have to get rid of the natural log by raising both sides to E. And this will give us a equilibrium constant of 0.32, which is slightly positive. 
So you'll notice right away my first impression when I saw 2.8 kilojoules, I thought, man, that's awfully close to equilibrium. And K is also awfully close to equilibrium. So we're confirming this via both of our values. If you thought immediately, huh, delta T is awfully close to equilibrium, and then we got some oddball number which was way off of equilibrium for K, you'd probably have to double check your arithmetic. So what I'd recommend you do, take this opportunity, run the exact same process for this uh, example below, and that's gonna be it for chapter 19. I'm gonna put together uh, next week, early next week, a recitation lecture, getting you guys ready for some of the, some additional problems uh, which may show up on the exam. And then we have one more chapter, electrochemistry, and that's going to be it for our Chem 106 experience. So uh, we're getting close, guys. I know we have a few holidays coming up. Focus, get your homework done early. Use this opportunity to then subsequently practice some of those homework problems. Use the recitation to then get even more specific studying done, going back to those homework problems and going into the examples in the book. And... Um, you guys are doing great, and I'll be talking at you again later next week.